customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we really thank you for being here this morning. Um, we're all from Brazil IT. We have Sérgio Pessoa, who is from Brascom, the industry association in Brazil. My name is Robert Jansen. I represent Softex, which is a government agency. We have Mark Bardo from Modulo, one of the companies. And we also have Manuel Fradi, Stephanie MIT, another company, and they're both very active on the ground. We're just going to give you a real rundown, a fast rundown, overview of the institutional aspect of Brazil and Brazil IT, and then provide you some in-depth more of what these guys can provide you as far as the value proposition. So, Sergio? Great. Thank you. Good morning. Sergio Pessoa, the Director of Market Development for Brest. We just want to give you a very brief perspective. You can move to the next slide, please. Uh, Brescon is the premier industry association uh, in Brazil. Uh, similar to NASCO in India, for those that are familiar, we have the large uh, players in the Brazilian market. In fact, our membership represents 70 plus percent of the IT GDP from Brazil. So you see, uh, you have uh, many of the multinational players, as well as the Brazilian companies that have a strong presence in Brazil and are starting to internationalize. Stefanini is one of our key uh, uh, members, and they are here. You're going to hear more from them. But the vision for Brazil really is uh, for Brescon is to provide. Um, to position Brazil as one of the top five global IT centers. Next, please. Just a very brief in terms of the agenda. Uh, from an institutional perspective, Antonio Gil, the president of Brescon, he sits in the National Council of Economic and Social Development with President Dilma, as well as in the National Com Council of uh, Country Competitiveness with Guido Montega, the Minister of Finance. So really is the voice of uh, the sector to, to the government uh, from an industry perspective. And those are the, the pillars that we have. We are certainly looking at the regulatory, because if we have complexities, we're looking at reducing the cost of doing business in Brazil. In fact, just recently, we had a huge win of reducing uh, the cost of uh, taxes. So the labor uh, social security contribution payroll went from 20% to zero, in fact, uh, now in January 1st, 2012, which means that you know the cost <coughs> will be more competitive as well, and we're moving that to a profit uh, taxation, uh, but also for software services for exports, that tax, that's 2.5% goes to zero as well. So we believe that's going to be a competitive framework. Same with human resources and education, where we're looking at providing the, the labor, the human capital. Uh, infrastructure innovation is the large programs to enable the sector. And market development, we need to sell the, the, the capabilities, the excellence of the IT uh, area in Brazil outside. Next, please. Just a brief perspective on the market. Uh, Brazil uh, has the seven largest I ICT market globally. Uh, we had a turnover of 85.1 billion uh, last year, which represents a 44% growth since 2008. So we have a significant growth in the market right now. For exports, just 9% in that same time frame, which really reflects the, the challenges that we have had with the currency. The real is very valuable which puts pressure, but that provides you a little bit of a perspective on how strong is, is the market. Next, please. So from a value proposition, I think there are a combination of factors that make Brazil a very unique uh, in location. Uh, certainly the business and the IT environment, the ability to innovate that we have in the country, uh, the total cost competitiveness, human capital and cultural affinity. Just briefly on those. It, uh, next, please, yeah. Uh, this one uh, shows you that you know not only the seventh largest economy and the seventh largest ICT market and the first in Latin America, but you sh you see the representativeness of Brazil uh, in terms of Latin America it, for the, the IT sector. And Latin here includes uh, Mexico as well. So certainly we have a huge representation. So the regional leadership is very strong, and more and more Brazil is starting to, to you know, from an ICT perspective to go global. Next, please. And uh, in terms of uh, market innovation, I think what we have seen in Brazil is a very diversified economy, very strong in many sectors, which also has fostered the ability for innovation in all those sectors. Certainly, the hyperinflation you know, of the 80s helped the financial services industry because we had to automate, and that created, created an outstanding capability there. But there's excellence in, in, in oil and gas. Uh, we have Embraer in, in the airplanes, so it's really a very fairly diversified, fairly sophisticated market, which have had the presence of uh, multinationals for decades, which creates a very Western uh, you know, environment, a very Western approach of doing business, which facilitates also in terms of companies that are there. In 
just in, in terms of total cost competitiveness, what we have seen, particularly for outsourcing and offshoring, is that the onshore offshore ratio, uh, because of, especially you know, if we look at the US and if we look at U U Europe, with the time zone that provides real time com communication that lowers some of the management costs, we have high productivity because of the domain expertise. I think that landscape of a business environment. You know, it provides a talent in, in many areas. So we have a strong industry and business knowledge. The cultural compatibility also is there, and the low turnover rates. All those factors really help productivity. And the uh, same as with quality, because we, we have seen lower, lower levels of free work than uh, comparing to, to Asia, uh, certainly. So the next slide, uh, we, we're going to talk about the human capital and the cultural landscape. And I think Robert uh, would like to provide some perspective on that. Well, um, at the end of the day, uh, we think that our value proposition, besides all of the IT infrastructure, the IT domestic market, is going to center into people. Because uh, uh, when we look at uh, problem solving, we look at several factors, and one of the key factors is cultural alignment. And uh, we like to illustrate how uh, Brazilian culture is able to align in the business space, is to a small story. It does not relate to IT. Uh, who likes pizza in this room? No one likes pizza? <laughs> Please, raise a hand. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Give me some support here. Okay. Well, if you like pizza the way I do, which is very thin and crusty, I recommend you to stop when you're going through San Francisco at North Beach Pizza. It's owned by a guy who's called John. He's from Greece. And it's a small shop. And every time I go back home to California, I make a pit stop there. Last time I was there, John had a smile pinned to his ear. I said, John, why are you so smiling? He says, you know, Robert, I beat those guys to the punch today. I said, who do you beat? Well, I beat Pizza's Hut and Domino's Pizza. Said, what do you mean? I beat them in the amount of pizzas delivered in one single day to the entire Bay Area. I said, how could you possibly do that, John? Those guys are a franchise. They have units scattered all over the Bay Area. You're just a one single shop. He said, Robert, I have a very tight delivery team here with me. I have 40 motorcyclists. 40 motorcycles? Where do you find these guys? Well, we have one criteria to hire them, which is be Brazilian. I said, well, what's so special? Well, Robert, they bring three critical success factors to my business. One, business expertise. If they can drive those motorcycles like they do down in Sao Paulo, they'll beat the rich guys out of Mumbai every single time. <laughs> Two, reliability and commitment. They're not tied to a nine to five job. They're not tied to a job description. They're committed to getting things done, whatever it takes. And three, resourcefulness and flexibility. Whatever unforeseen events that happens in the front line, they take care of it right then and there. They don't bring back to me a problem. They tell me what solution they gave. So we like to reflect on that in bringing those three critical success factors into our IT world, the IT space. At the end of the day, we're looking to solve a problem. It's a problem-solving approach. And for that, you need business expertise. For that, you need reliability and commitment, and you also need flexibility and resourcefulness. And now talking about resourcefulness, I want to invite the first company, Mark Bardo from Modulo, to talk about their resourcefulness and helping you access vendor management. Mark Bardo. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've talked about some great big topics, and I want to bring you down to a very specific niche. Um, I represent, Sorry. I did represent, <laughs> I represent um, a company called Modulo Security, which was the largest, which is today the largest niche consultancy vendor in Brazil. It's expanded uh, globally. We have operation in the US, and I opened the operation uh, a couple of years ago. And one of the topics that I wanted to relate to is vendor risk management. It's an area that's incredibly of interest. We partner with IBM Global Services the world over, but vendor risk management. You know, most of you represent organizations that are expanding the ecosystem of partners that you have as you outsource the elements of your business. And part of that is how do you ensure that those partners really maintain the standards that you have set for yourself internally? Because if there's a damage in that relationship, they lose your data, they end up losing your you know, company information in any way, it affects your brand, your value. And that's one of the areas that we are expanding our services. Okay. In a 
nutshell, we are in the GRC domain, GRC governance, risk, and compliance. I'm going to talk about one topic in the short time I have with you this morning, just to give you a sort of an incident, a view of one particular area. But these are the challenges that are forcing, or at least driving, purchases of GRC. The one, and I'll just touch on the first two, because the last two are, are the objectives I'm sure all of you are constantly uh, looking for. The first one is, how do we automate the GRC process? Can we automate the element of the GRC process? And the second one, and we have customers in the UK, Holland, Germany, and the Middle East particularly, and all of them want to comply not just with <coughs> one standard, they want to comply with multiple standards. That's what they're looking for GRC type offerings. I hate to put a, a diagram of a, of a laptop, but ultimately, this also is behind that drive. We want one repository for those standards, one repository for that risk assessment activity, but we want to be role-based. We can access it from anywhere, from any device. That's another key requirement of the solution. What's also, forgive the, the plug, also is the connectivity. And GRC is connected to all sorts of areas. If you carry out a risk assessment process and find out your employees aren't following your policy, you need to introduce a policy, a policy around risk and compliance, so you manage that. If you have a risk and compliance policy, that's related to your business continuity, etc., etc. So GRC is growing as a market because of the interrelationship between all these different application areas. But the one I want to just touch on today is vendor management. So vendor management, I don't know what priority this stands within all, all your areas of activity, but what we're finding, and have um, two particular customers that I'm thinking of, a bank um, and a fast-moving consumer goods company. This activity, a global fast-moving consumer goods company, this activity is spread, spread all over the organization. Ownership is held by different people in different geographies, even though there's a compliance, head of compliance for the whole entity. So there is, it's time-consuming, there are no metrics or standards, and also there's no assessment of which vendors are more valuable <coughs> which vendors are the riskiest in terms of your organization. So what do we want? What's the opportunity here? Is, is there a solution? And by the way, we provide these solutions through third parties, and we've also done this directly for some of our customers. How can we unify vendor management? Is there a process that we can automate that? Um, how can we decide to switch vendors based on their risk or based on their compliance? Also, we have contractual issues to take into consideration also. Um, do we have service providers that can carry out this activity for us? Now, there is a process, there is a methodology behind how we carry this, this work out. We create what we call a governance risk map. We relate each vendor. A vendor is an asset for us. We relate each vendor to each application in your enterprise. We relate each application and that relationship to your business process. And hence, we start getting color coding about operations being more significant than your training environment, for example. So you're <coughs> starting to classify vendors in terms of their impact to your business. We carry out an analysis, as you'd expect. These are the sorts of things that you'd expect in a tool of this type. Ultimately, you're concentrating your time, where you want to concentrate your time, on decision-making of the assessment that you've carried out. So we want to centralize all our vendor information, we want to restrict who gets access to this information. So I have a bank in, in, the, in the UK space. They, they have uh, the particular assessment that they're doing is around a security questionnaire. They've now categorized their vendors and they're starting to find some surprising results on which vendors impact which part of their business. They didn't know that because this was being managed by separate people. All sorts of things about tracking activity. You then establish a relationship with the vendors. It's nothing like a diagram to actually bring it forward, but you start to look at which vendors impact those processes, not just in terms of, but visually. And this is, I, I, I've got a customer who's printed this out across the whole room, and then the manager meeting happened here, they're starting to understanding for the first time what those relationships were. Useful. And this is ultimately the aim of a process like this. Again, one aspect of this of the tool. If I look at this process, we start to look at where we're spending time in this activity. Why automate it? Well, what we've found is where you really want to concentrate your time is the decision making.
This is the collection of data. This is the collection of risk data. This is the collection of risk information. What you then start to do, once you automate that process in the first year, you spend more time on decision making. 45% of the time, second year, 65% of the time. That's the benefit of automating it. You want to gather the info. You want to focus your time on decision making. <coughs> and then as you'd expect, you get a graphical view. You can share this globally with all the individuals responsible. They log onto a portal, look at which vendors, because obviously you have multiple vendors that cross multiple geographies. Where do you start? And forgive the speed of this, but um, uh, do you have a, a vendor inventory? Um, who has access to it? How does it get updated? Do you have a, prof a risk profile for vendors? Do you have a contract value associated with, with the risk value? What are the dates, etc. give you one aspect of a GRC solution that Modlo is a, a leading vendor in this space, according to Gartner, who are um, hosting this event. I hope that was useful. Gave you a snapshot of a Brazilian company with a solution that's actually been rolled out uh, globally. Thank you very much, Adina. Thank you, Mark. And now we want to have uh, one of our top pure thoroughbred Brazilian IT services multinational. Our first one, which is Stephanie in IT. Manuel Friday, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I pass my card around? And <laughs> those of you that might give your card in return, let me know then uh, if we need further contacts. Uh, uh, Stefanini Tech Team, or Stefanini IT Solutions, is known in Brazil, is a privately owned company. Uh, our president, Marco Stefanini, is actually here today. So, Marco. Thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, it's a company that has grown considerably uh, in these uh, last few years, 34% compounded annual growth on the back of the Brazilian economy, but also expansion in the uh, United States, Europe, and global expansion. And I, I would like to share with you uh, a quick overview of what we do, what our company is, of both how we can help you in Brazil, but also outside. Uh, uh, we have a broad global presence. You see here that uh, we are presently currently in 28 countries serving customers in 32 languages. The company was founded in Brazil and therefore you see a very strong presence in uh, South America. But also we are present in North America with the acquisition last year of a couple of companies we made there. And with that we also gained a, a broader footprint in Europe. Uh, very complimentary, Stefanini was already operating in Europe. Uh, and with the acquisition basically became very complementary. We are uh, in China, in India, and also Australia, and I will show in a little while our delivery centers and so on. Uh, our greatest assets are our people. We are a people company, as we say. Uh, 13,600 employees globally, with a retention rate of around 89%. Uh, that goes also, of course, with a very high customer retention rate, and I'll touch that point later. You'll see that the customers we started the company with, or Marco started many years ago, they are still our customers today, which shows a degree of satisfaction. Uh, in terms of platform, what we serve, 60% uh, around web and mobility. Uh, we still have quite some support on mainframe, and I'll show you later that you know, we come initially from the financial sector, so there you still find a lot of COBOL applications and so on, and we still support that. And on client server, about 10%. If you look at the profile of our people, then we see that we have quite an experienced crew, uh, mainly because of high retention rates, and uh, with 45% people are considered with experience, 40% are experts in their field of expertise, and of course we have trainees, 15% to continuously renew the know-how and the, the learnings in the company. We have including also uh, international trainee exchange programs where we send from one continent to another. Uh, in here, if you look at our service offering, we're a full-fledged uh, IT company uh, on managed services, IT infrastructure, uh, with service desk and desktop management, a very strong area, uh, application lifecycle management and support, and also in business process outsourcing. Uh, in system and integration and development, uh, you see here uh, as custom software development in mainframe, web environments, mobility, etc. Again, 
system integration projects. Uh, we have content management on portals. We're very strong in SharePoint and SAP consultancy, uh, both in Europe and in Latin America. In consulting, we have subconsult. We offer subconsult consulting services, uh, Oracle ERP, and uh, business intelligence. We also offer support to CA Technologies. We are on the, uh, on the approved uh, uh, list. And here at the bottom you see some of the technologies that we support uh, at our customers. As I said, very strong financial background services, how the company started, but also very strong in manufacturing. These are the two main sectors. But you see that we are present, present in a variety of industry segments. And here I come to our global delivery model, uh, showing you where we do our talent recruiting, our global service desks uh, support, and also the application and development centers. Uh, obviously Brazil as our headquarters. Uh, in Argentina, we have service desk and uh, development centers. We also have in Mexico quite a large center uh, development and in the US. In Europe, we are headquartered in Belgium, in Brussels, but our main operation and delivery center and development is actually in Romania. Uh, there we have in Romania, for example, in delivery around 600 people, and we have over 200 people, developers, particularly for web sphere, web applications, and so on. Uh, we are in present also in the Nordics, uh, India, obviously, and we have also a delivery center in the Philippines. And we are now setting up one in China. We already have operations in China, in delivery, but we're setting up our, with a partner. We're now set, setting up our own delivery center in China. Uh, <coughs> you see here, from a location here, shore and offshore, in the US and Canada, then we serve, you know, 24 by 7, follow the same concept. Then from near shore in, uh, in, in South America, offshore India, the Philippines, because of the language of North America, but also Romania. Uh, as I told you before, we serve the customers in 32 different languages. Uh, in Asia, uh, from India and Philippines, but offshore also from uh, Latin America and Romania. Uh, and then in Europe, near shore Poland, Romania and Belgium. And then we cover the offshore from the Philippines, India, Mexico, Argentina. So we're really able to provide, and I'll share with you some uh, cases we have, Particularly global companies provide round-the-clock global service within one same standard. Here are some cases. Uh, I have five cases just to share with you. Ford is our customer since 1979. We do all the service desk and desktop support for Ford. Uh, these are the countries that we support. Uh, 50,000 calls per month. And it's in the outsourcing infrastructure, but you see that we support different, uh, also applications and different platforms. Uh, we work under the spot serve, uh, uh, concept, so the single point of contact for this, for the service desk, providing security services, desktop management, we do PC deployment, upgrades, so we have both the, the first and second and third level support. Uh, we serve them in English, German, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, and the typical challenges always continuous cost improvement, you know, adopting ITIL, techno ITIL uh, principles. And uh, I would say, you know, working since 79, we have a happy customer. Many testimonials. Actually, at this very moment, we have one customer that I'll talk about downstairs giving a testimonial to in one of the rooms I'll mention in a while. Uh, another large customer is John Deere since 1999. Uh, we offer service desk and desktop management, deploying new technologies, and we also do security. 36,000 contacts per month. We support 151,000 users. Uh, across the world, we have 75 agents in the various delivery centers dedicated to John Deere. Uh, some in Germany, in Romania, in the US, so across the world. And we support them in English, Spanish, German, French, Italian, Russian, Finnish, Swedish. So we have, for example, uh, as, as we saw before, I said we have a delivery center in the Nordics, and from there we serve with the Nordic languages. Alcoa, another large
large account, uh, more recent, since 2006. Uh, service test, desktop. Uh, we also do some staffing. Again, security very much. 12,000 contacts per month, supporting 30,000 uh, users. Uh, in here, we also support a number of applications and specific applications proprietary. They work, and we also provide that, for example, in our delivery uh, centers. In an enclosed environment with security, it's we work within their systems with full access, and so we provide their customer area, which is uh, then totally screened from the rest of the customers. Uh, again, you see uh, quite a vast number of languages, and we serve them actually from the US, where we have one delivery center in Michigan, from Romania, from Brazil, and from Australia, providing this global 24 by 7 support. Uh, the customer I was just referring earlier that we have a presentation right now going on downstairs is Travelport. I don't know how many of you are familiar. Travelport is, they provide the solutions for uh, travel agents that to make all the bookings into the airlines and travel systems. They support their work with three systems you might have heard about, Worldspan, Galileo, and Apollo. When sometimes you make a travel reservation, you see these. And we provide the support uh, the business, this is a BPO uh, example, we provide global support for travel port. Uh, from, in all these languages, because as you can imagine, they are present with travel agents all over the world. They offer the system and we provide the support. Uh, in over more than 20 languages or 20 countries. And uh, in these three systems. So airline, ticketing, pr printing, and solving all the problems that the users might have. And last but not least, uh, on the application field, <coughs> HSBC is one of our large customers. In applications, we do software development and maintenance services. Uh, also, some, uh, some level of staffing for when they have projects. Uh, but just to give an idea of uh, what we have, and last night we had dinner with the, with the CIO here in, in London, uh, we are talking of something in the range of 800,000 hours per year of, uh, of services to HSBC. Uh, and we do that in uh, five countries in Latin America and also across Europe. Here you see, go back to what I said, the COBOL, still some of the, the IBM traditional languages that banks use. But we've been engaged with banks also developing front-end applications to their old uh, COBOL, so they're more user-friendly. And therefore you see Java, WebSphere, uh, C, and so, C language, and so on. So uh, also a very happy customer with whom we have a, a, a very close relationship uh, and goes very much to the root of our business. As I said, uh, Marco started the company in the financial sector. Uh, there are many other cases. The idea of today was just to give you a flavor you know, on, the, on, on what we do in infrastructure, uh, uh, application development and consulting. Uh, we also, of course, for those interested, we also uh, last night had, uh, were with customers Petrobras is our large customer, uh, Banco do Brazil is a large customer, uh, and we are we have a very strong presence in Brazil. As we said, the company has grown 34% year on year in these last uh, few years, and uh, we've then Mark started uh, the expansion outside Brazil with acquisitions, uh, supporting Brazilian customers outside, but also helping foreign companies to work in Brazil, where knowing the country is, is quite important. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer you or talk to you at any time, all right? Thank you very much for the attention. We have a couple more minutes if you'd like to make any questions to Mark or to Manuel uh, of anything that you've seen. We invite you to come down to our booth, Brazil IT and Stephanie. We both are located downstairs. We can answer any questions you may have. And I have one question. Is cultural alignment important today for you? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'd like to come back to a slide here, which illustrates a little bit one thing people don't realize. In, not, in 2006, Business Review Institute went out to study the mixes of the races. And they concluded that the most mixed race on the planet is the Brazilian race. I'm half American, half Brazilian. And as an American, I've always heard about the uh, United States being a melting pot. As an American, I disagree with that statement. The United States never really melted. It's siloed. You have a very diverse immigration influence, 
but all siloed, never really melted. In Brazil, it's the contrary. It's all of those races into a single blender, and it turned on. And at the end of the day, that reflects into the cultural life. A project on paper is beautiful. Paper takes anything and everything. Once you roll out that project out and put it onto the field, you start finding out things that work and things that don't work. And you need to bring your teams that are, that are geographically dispersed back into the same common language, common base. And that's where the cultural alignment lies. And the largest Japanese community outside Japan, in, in Brazil. The largest German community outside Germany, in Brazil. The largest Italian community outside Italy, in Brazil. The largest Polish, as well. And it goes on. So at the end of the day, uh, when we have a saying that we use, we use football a lot in our in, in metaphors. So once you get a bad pass, you know, so you can trap a square ball and put it round on the ground. Uh, we translate that into hit the ground running, meaning that uh, we are able, because of our culturalness or uh, our full understanding or the no cultural barriers, to take any type of problem solving need and uh, just run it off on the ground and hit the ground running every time. Uh, so we like to say, besides all the technical skills, and the largest mainframe installed base outside the U.S. worldwide is in Brazil. The largest Java community worldwide outside the U.S. is also in Brazil. So technically speaking, we go from mainframe all the way down to open source. So there's no uh, question about technical capability. So at the end of the day, it's harnessing the people behind uh, with a proper problem-solving approach and with the proper cultural alignment. So we believe that uh, in Brazil, uh, because of this huge mix of races, we offer one of the best world cultural alignments there is. So we definitely invite you to experience a little bit of that culture downstairs. We have a little bit of what we call a coconut caipirinha. Uh, we're going to be offering over lunchtime. All right. Thank you very much. That's for the afternoon off, is it? Yes. <laughs> yes, you won't remember much. For yes. <laughs> remember, close the deals before lunch, then. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Get the menu, uh, business cards. No, no, no. If you... Yeah. Thank you very much.